Sunday, Andrew McGarry. God bless you. Take your Bibles. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 53. On your way there, let's reflect upon a scripture that was brought up already. But that scripture is John chapter 10, verse 10. And it says, the devil came to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But I am come, says Jesus Christ, for this very purpose, to give life and life more abundantly, that they might have life and life more abundant. Let's read a section in Isaiah 53 pertaining to what the prophesied Messiah would do. And keep in mind, this section of scripture is written about 600 years approximately before Jesus Christ shows up on the scene. Isaiah 53. I'm not even there. And it says concerning the Messiah and his mission, what he would do. It says, who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. He has no form or comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire of him. Uh, that word form there is also the word for comely, meaning handsome. He just looks like a regular guy. <laughs> uh, there, there's nothing that we can see in the really in the flesh that gives him the trappings of royalty. Verse three, he is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. Interestingly, here in this verse, in verse four, it says, surely he has born, if you're reading the King James Version. And uh, th that word means surely he has carried or taken upon himself. He has taken upon himself our grief. That, that Hebrew word there for grief is the word makab, or kali, actually. Um, and what that means is sicknesses. He's taken upon himself our sicknesses. Let's keep reading. And carried our what? Sorrows. That's a Hebrew word, makab, which means our mental pain as well as our physical pain. So Jesus Christ is taking upon himself our sickness, our physical pain, our mental pain. And it says we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. You know, when Jesus Christ was getting crucified, he was getting mocked. And people were thinking that he was the one who was cursed of God. But Jesus Christ was taking our place. He was taking upon himself our wrongdoing, our transgression, our sickness, our mental pain, as well as physical pain. So if Jesus Christ was taking on our mental pain, our physical pain. Uh, there's no uh, use in you trying to keep it. <laughs> Verse five, but he was wounded for whose transgressions? Our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquity and the chastisement of our peace was upon him, meaning the chastisement that produced our peace with God fell on him. He took the penalty that we were deserving. of. He took our transgressions upon him, our iniquities upon him, our griefs, sorrows, sicknesses, mental and physical pains. And with his stripes, we are what? Healed. Healed. Jesus is awesome. <laughs> Jesus is great. Verse six, all we like sheep had gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. This is the state of the world without God. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Now, I want you to look at verse six, where it says the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. So God laid this upon him. But we read in verse four that he took it upon himself. What we see there is we see the relationship between God and his son, the trust, the faithfulness, the love. God says, I'll lay this upon you, a loving father laying this upon 
his son, I'm going to lay upon you a heavy burden and a heavy responsibility. What is that? The fate of all mankind. <laughs> right? But then we also see the strongest son, the humblest son, taking it upon himself. Taking it upon himself, that which the father is laying upon him. You see a great relationship there between the father and his son, Jesus Christ. But there are questions to be had. And for some people who might not know, one question might come up in their minds. And that question might be, but was Jesus Christ forced? Was he coerced? Was he just doing it because it was only his father's will and he's just trying to be an obedient son, but doesn't really want to do it? That might be a question that somebody has, and it's a good question. And the Bible's got answers for that question. Let's go to John chapter 10. Verse 17 of John chapter 10. Therefore does my father love me, says Jesus, because I lay down my life that I might take it again. What does he say in verse 18? No man takes it from me. I lay it down of myself. What does this show? His willingness. His willingness to be obedient. He took it upon himself. He was not coerced by anybody. He wanted to do it. And knowing the disposition of heart that Christ had and knowing the disposition of heart that God has helps us to access them easier because it shows this was our plan. We wanted to do this for you. <laughs> no man takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my father. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 12. Says a little bit more on this uh, on this theme. Hebrews chapter twelve says, in verse two, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the what joy that was set before him endured the cross. Despising the shame and is set down at the right hand of God. Why did Jesus Christ endure the cross? Joy. Willingly. Nobody takes my life. I lay it down. And for the joy set before me, I'm going to endure the heaviest burden that has ever been placed on a man. I'm going to do it because I love my father, because I trust him, because I know he will not let, he will not let my soul corrupt, that he will not leave me alone. But I'm doing it also because I'm willing. I want to do it. And for the joy set before me in God's plans of salvation, I will willfully take this up. Thank you, Jesus. Let's go to, I like this section. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 50. It's another prophetic section about the coming Messiah, what he would do, what his plan was, how he would accomplish it. But this one is written from the perspective of the Messiah, of the prophesied Messiah. So it's written in the first person. Uh, I, I really like this. It says, the Lord has given me the tongue of the learned that I should know how to speak. Oh, verse four, sorry. Uh, Isaiah 50, verse four. The Lord God has given me the tongue of the learned that I should know how to speak a word in season to him that is weary. He wakens my he wakens morning by morning. He wakens mine ear to hear as the learning. Uh, in other translations, I believe in the New American Standard Bible, it says he wakens my ear to hear as a disciple. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Once again, the relationship between God and his son, Jesus Christ. God, let me hear like a disciple. Verse five, the Lord God has opened mine ear and I was not rebellious, neither turned away back. Verse six, I gave my back to the smiters. Now, this is a prophecy concerning the beatings and the sufferings that he will go through before he takes the cross. I gave my back to the smiters and my cheeks to them that pluck off the hair. I hid not my face from shame and from spitting. 
when we read the records in the gospel, and we won't go to them today, but I suggest you go and read them to yourself. There was some heavy stuff that's happening in Jesus Christ. They're putting a bag over his head and then punching him and then saying, prophesy, who hit you? They're spitting on him. They're plucking hair out of his beard. He's getting hit down and he's looking to the side, watching his closest homeboy, Peter, deny him three times. What's he taking upon himself all that time? Physical pain, the mental pain, right? Emotional pain. He's taking it all upon himself. But how is he doing it? Willingly. I gave my cheeks to the smiters. I gave my back to them. I hid not my face. Why? Verse seven or verse. Yeah. Verse seven for the Lord. God will help me. <laughs> Therefore, shall I not be confounded? Therefore, have I set my face like a flint and I know that I shall not be ashamed, even going through the the deepest trench of suffering of mankind, taking upon himself all the mental anguish, all the emotional anguish, all the physical pain, and the, uh, oh yeah, and not to mention all the spiritual baggage of all of mankind, he is still not going to look at himself like a victim. He said, I will not be ashamed. I will not hide my face. I give my cheeks to the smiters. I give my back to them who beat me. Why? Because the Lord God will help me and I'm not going to be ashamed. It's pretty powerful, huh? <laughs> verse 8, he is near. Why is he doing all this stuff? He is near that justifies me, verse 8. Oh, I love this. Who will contend with me? Let us stand together. Who is my adversary? Let him come near me. You know what he's saying? Bring it on. <laughs> you want some? Come get it. Who's going to contend with me? Who's going to fight me? Let him approach. Who's my enemy? Let him stand in front of me. This guy's a bad dude. <laughs> He's a this guy. Is, I mean, our Lord and Savior is a bad mamma jamma. I mean, this guy is a bad dude. All right. Who wants him? Come get it. While he's getting beat up, right? While he's taking upon him everything. Verse nine. Behold, behold, the Lord God will help me. Who is he that shall condemn me? He's saying, if God isn't condemning me, nobody can. Their accusations are hollow. So was Jesus Christ forced? No. And in fact, it, the exact opposite. He almost at this, these verses almost show us that he reveled and enjoyed doing it willfully. He understood the plan. Obviously, it came with difficulty. There's that prayer in the garden where he's sweating like he's sweating drops of blood, it says. He's going through a hard time. But what's he doing there? He's taking upon himself the mental anguish of us all. <laughs> he's taking it upon himself. He's carrying it. And he's doing it with God. Let's go to John 17. Let's read a section. It's one of the last prayers that Jesus Christ prays before he goes and confronts um, the Romans, uh, confronts Judas, and before he goes to Gethsemane, which will really kind of initiate the beginnings of his sufferings leading up to his crucifixion. Look at what's on his mind. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. <laughs> We're just going to read this whole section because it's good. John 17. And we're going to start in verse... One, these words spake Jesus and lift up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hours come. What's he talking about? His crucifixion is like, it's go time, dad. Here we go. Glorify thy son that thy son also may glorify thee. As you have given him power over all flesh that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. And this is eternal life that they might Know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. It's funny because eternal life is a time period, right? But he adds a relational component in it. This is eternal life, that they might know you. 
<laughs> and they might know whom you have sent, your son, Jesus Christ. Verse four, I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which you gave me to do. And now, O oh Father, glorify thou me with your own self, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. I have manifested your name unto the men which you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they have known that all things whatsoever you have given me are of you. For I have given unto them the words which you gave me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came from thee, and they have believed that you did send me. I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which, the, which you have given me, for they are yours. And all mine are yours, and all yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world. He's knowing my mission here is going to be about done. I'm not going to be here. They're going to be here. What do we want to do with them while they're here? Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom you have given me, that they may be one like we are one. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name, those that you, that you gave me. I have kept, and none of them is lost, but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. And now I come to you, that these things I speak in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. As you have sent me into the world, even so have I sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I set myself apart, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Verse 20, neither pray for I these alone. So that prayer he just did was for his 12, his disciples, the people he loved that he knew of. But let's see who he's praying for now. Neither pray for I these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. This is a prayer for the future church. <laughs> that they all might be one as you, Father, are to me and I am thee, that they also may be one in us that the word that the world may believe that you have sent me and the glory which you gave me i have given them that they may be one just like we are one i and them and them and me that they may be made perfect in one and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as thou hast Love them. Verse 24. Father, and make note of this request. Father, I will that they also, whom you have given me, be with me where I am. <laughs> that they may behold my glory, which you've given me. For you loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I've known you. And these have known that you have sent me. And I have declared unto them your name and will declare it that the love where you have loved me may be in them and I in them. <laughs> it's a powerful prayer for the church, isn't it? That the love wherewith you love me, what it's like, okay, so. This is kind of like a common adage, right? God loves me. God loves me. And people think that, but I don't know if they get the depth of it. He loves you to the same extent he loves Jesus Christ. Now, nobody thinks that he doesn't love Jesus Christ. <laughs> Wherewith they have, thou hast loved me, may be in them, and I in them. He made a request. He said, Father, I will that they would be with me, that you would love them, that they would know that you love them as much as you love me, and that I would be in them. That's his request for the church. Let's see if that prayer was answered. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 1. <laughs> I 
Ephesians chapter 1. Verse 3, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in where? Heavenly places in Christ. Heavenly places in Christ. Heavenly places in Christ. Let's see uh, verse, uh, let's go to verse 15. Keep that in your mind. Heavenly places in Christ. Verse 15. This is Paul's prayer for the church. This is my prayer for all of us. And I'm going to read this prayer like it's addressed to us, okay? Like it's addressed to me. This I actually like to pray this prayer often. Uh, Wherefore also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints, verse 15, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. This is Paul's prayer for them. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him, so that the eyes of your understanding might be illuminated, that you may know. So he's praying. This is my prayer for you, Ephesians Church. This is my prayer for the church today. This is my prayer for you, believer, reading this letter that I've written, that you might, from God, the Father of glory, Receive the spirit of wisdom and revelation in knowing him for the purpose of your eyes being illuminated to understanding so that you would know a couple things. You, so that you would know these things. Verse 18, what the hope of your calling is, what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints is, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe according to the working of his mighty power. That's a lot of things to know. And those are good things to know. The hope you're calling, the riches of his glory and his inheritance, and the exceeding greatness of his power. Verse 20, which he wrought in Christ when he what? Raised him from the dead. That word wrought is the word demonstrated. That's what that means. It means he demonstrated the hope of his calling, the riches of the glory of his inheritance, and his exceeding great power. He demonstrated it. Not articulated it, not pontificated it, not verbalized it, demonstrated, right? Demonstrated in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places. That's two things. That's resurrection and then exaltation, right? Resurrection from the dead and then ascended him, exalted him to the right hand of God. Two things, right? And he ascended, he ascended him far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but in that which is to come. So it's as far above. He's far above all principality, power, might, and dominion. Uh, the principalities, powers, might, and dominion uh, means like the governing bodies of oversight. Um, he exalted him far above. Second place is not close. <laughs> right second place is it's like i don't know yeah it's, it's like there's the flesh realm here's the spiritual realm of darkness and then far above that far above all principality right there's no there's no like contest or struggle for who wins like, or who's got more authority or who's got more oversight or who's got more superiority far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named not only in this world but also in that which is to come so forever he's far above he's far above forever and has put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church which is his body the fullness of him that fills all in all now the uh Let's just continue reading through because we've seen here, Paul's prayer is that they would know, that their understanding would be illuminated, that they would have the spirit of wisdom and revelation to know Christ, to know the hope of their calling, to know the glory of the riches of their, of their inheritance, to know his exceeding great power, and to know that he's demonstrated already previously in the exaltation and resurrection of Jesus Christ. But knowing that, why is that important? We're going to see that here. Verse 1, chapter 2. And you has he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, right? He took upon himself all of our sins and iniquities. 
When in time past, you did walk according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience. He's saying you were like this before. <laughs> among whom also we had our conversation in times past in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. He said, this was the plight of all men. Every man was like this. But God, who was rich in the very thing that we needed, mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, has quickened, made us alive, together with who? Christ. By grace are you see, saved, and has raised us up together and made us sit together where? In heavenly places. The resurrection and exaltation of Jesus Christ is important because it shows you your positioning. Because if I put this pencil in this book and I go like this and I put the book up here, the pencil goes there too. Why? Because the pencil is in the book right now what's our position in christ seated in heavenly places far above far above second place right and he has put all things under his feet which is the church to the church the body of him that fill uh, the full uh, fullness of him and the body of him that fills all them all so everybody's every believer is, is a is a, in the body of Christ. And even if you think that for some special reason, you are the bunion on the pinky toe of Jesus, <laughs> you are still far above all principality and power and might and dominion, not because of what we've done, but because of what he's done in taking it upon himself and saying, who will contend with me? Bring mine adversary near. Let him stand in front of me. I'll give my back. I'll give my cheek. I'll hide not my face. That's our Lord. Ephesians 3. I love it because the Bible says it. It's what the Bible says, baby. <laughs> Ephesians 3. Let's see uh, verse 8. Unto me who am less than the least of all saints... Is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world has been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ, to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers where in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God, according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is an amazing verse because it shows God's intention with his eternal purpose. What's his intention? To show the powers in heavenly places, God's wisdom and power. To the intent now that the principalities and powers in heavenly places. Now in the heavenly realms, you've got two kingdoms, right? You've got the holy kingdom of God. You've got the spiritual kingdom of darkness uh, that's held down by Satan and his hosts, right? He, his intention, his eternal purpose through Christ Jesus, which was hid but now is revealed, is that he would show the spiritual forces of darkness as well as the holy kingdom, this is my wisdom, this is my power. And what is it? The church. Why? Because the church has Christ in them, and he's seated far above all spiritual power, above all principality, might, and dominion in high places, and so is the church. You know, the devil had a hard time with Jesus Christ when he was on the earth. That's one Jesus, right? That's one person. And he thought he thought he won at the crucifixion. But it was like, you know, that those, those cartoons with the hydra snake, you cut off one head and two comes in its place. Except you cut off one head, you think, and now billions and billions of the body of Christ, far above all principality and power, are alive preaching the gospel. Man, this is amazing stuff. This is, the, this is our identity. This is what God would have us to know about whom we are and whose we are. 
He doesn't want a bunch of defeated Christians who think of themselves as like pieces of, of crap in the dust. He said, no, I elevated my son so that you could know that you've been elevated to that same position. I had him take upon himself all of your failure so that you could take upon him so that you could take upon his victory and identity. Ephesians 6. What am I talking about here? I'm talking about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Ephesians 6, 10, it says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle, wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against, there we are again, principalities, powers against the what? Rulers of darkness of this world against spiritual wickedness. And the word here, it says high places. That word, they should have rendered the right Greek word. It's the word udernos. It's heavenly places. It's the Greek word for heavenly places. All right. So what is God saying here? I've given you a great identity. I've given you a new position. I want you to know what that position is. And I want you to don some armor so that you can stand against the spiritual forces of darkness and win. <laughs> right? And win. Like Jesus. Who's going to contend with me? Let him come. Let him stand. <laughs> Why? Because we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. We wrestle against the spiritual principalities, powers, against rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And then we go on, we see those pieces of armor, the helmet of salvation, the shield of, of faith, the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth, our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. All these things given to us because we will contend with the spiritual forces of darkness, but we'll win. <laughs> this word armor in verse 12, uh, verse 11, put on the whole armor of God, only comes up one other place in, in the Bible. And uh, it's actually really interesting. Let's go there. Let's go to Luke chapter 11. This is an instance in uh, Jesus Christ's earthly ministry. And uh, let's just uh, let the let's let the context talk to us. Verse fourteen of Luke eleven, and he was casting out a devil, and it was dumb, meaning it was a, a mute devil. Uh, it was a, a devil spirit that kept somebody from being able to speak mute, right? And it came to pass when the devil was gone out, the dumb spake, and the people wondered; they were in awe. But some of them said he cast devils, he casts out devils through Beelzebub, the chief, chief of devils. So he does this thing, uh, brings this person to great deliverance. Um, and some people go, wow, what an amazing thing. And other people say, oh, no, but he actually does that in the power of Satan. <laughs> All right. These are the different responses that Jesus Christ went through in his earthly ministry. And we might go through also walking in Christ. Verse 16. And other, tempting him, sought him a sign from heaven. But he, knowing their thoughts, said, every kingdom against itself is brought to desolation. So oh, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to destruction. And a house divided against itself falls. So he, he's starting off with this little phrase. It's like, if a house is divided against itself, it's not going to stand for very long. It's going to, if division comes in and the kingdom is divided against itself, it will not stand. It will be destroyed. And he's saying, now if, verse 18, if Satan be divided against himself, because they just said he casts out devil spirits by the power of Satan, right? Uh, how shall his kingdom stand? So he's saying, if I'm really doing this in the name of the enemy, uh, it's kind of dumb. Why would the enemy want his own people dividing themselves against his own kingdom, right? Because you say that I cast out devils through Beelzebub, verse 19. And if by and if I by Beelzebub cast out devils, by whom do your sons cast them out? <laughs> Therefore, they shall be your judges. You know what he's saying here? Your sons haven't been able to do this. I have. And now that I have, you say that I'm filled with the devil spirit or do this in the power of the enemy. I like this. Verse 20. But if I with the finger of God, just the, just the finger, 
the finger of God, not the enemy, cast out devils, then no doubt the kingdom of God has come upon you. What is he saying? If I can do this and it's truly of God, then there's no doubt the kingdom of God is upon you right now. Represented right here in its king. <laughs> Verse 21. When a strong man armed keeps his palace, his goods are in peace. But when a stronger than he shall come upon him and overcome him, he takes from him all his armor. This is the other place wherein he trusted and divides his spoils. Now, what is he saying here? He says, when a strong man armed keeps his palace, his goods are at peace, meaning they're secure. Who's the strong man? It's the devil. When the devil keeps his palace, he's the strong man. And he's called the God of this world in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. He's called the prince of the power of the air. We read that in Ephesians chapter 2. There's other places. He's saying when the strong man keeps his palace, his house, his palace would be the world. His goods are at peace, meaning it's secure. He's strong. He's got it. It's secure. Now, remember the context here. He has just proven that he has superior authority to a devil spirit by casting it out in front of them, right? Verse 22, but when a stronger than he shall come, come upon him and overcome him, he takes from him all his armor wherein he trusted and divides the what? Spoils. What is he saying? He's saying when there's a strong man who has his own house, everything is secure until a stronger one comes in and takes it away from him. What's the goods that's being taken away from the enemy here? The life of that person. That's the goods of the enemy. The lives of people. And if he's uncontested, all his things are at peace. But when a stronger than him comes and takes the goods. <laughs> and I mean, as a Christian, I really don't advocate for uh, breaking and entering and burglary. But at this, in this one, in this little... Uh, snippet in this. <laughs> He's going into the strong man's house and removing the treasures of the strong man. That's the lives of mankind. Verse 21. But he shall, or verse 22, but when a stronger than he shall come upon him and overcome him, he takes from him all his armor and divides his spoil. In Ephesians 6, we hear that God gives us some armor. He said, we've heard, we saw in Ephesians, Jesus Christ far above all principality and power. He's showing it here. But the resurrection and the exaltation, what does that mean for us? It means we're seated with him. We're identi identified with him. And he goes into the strong man's house, who is uncontested, and plunders it, spoils it. Strips him of his armor, the thing he trusted in, and spoils it. And that, what does he mean by spoil? He takes the lives back. The place that the enemy had influence and had sway the stronger one comes and says, dumb spirit, leave. Now you speak. He is authenticating his authority. He's showing it and he's proving it. Now, in light of that and in light of our position, uh, let's go to Colossians chapter three. Remember, he spoils it. Oh, Colossians chapter two. And we'll get closer to closing. Colossians chapter two. It says he goes in there, the stronger one comes, takes his good, removes his armor, and divides his spoils. Colossians 2. Let's read in verse 13. And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, has he quickened together, made alive with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. <laughs> Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, meaning the debt. He paid it and blotted it out, canceled the debt. It's all done. And took it out of the way. How? Nailing it to his cross. Verse 15. And having what principalities? Spoiled. Spoiled principalities and powers. He made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. See what he's doing? He's showing the heavenly powers. In heavenly places, the stronger one has come. And the intention of the manifold wisdom of God is that the heavenly powers might know his wisdom through what? The operation of the church. Though them identified 
with Christ Jesus. Same Christ, same power, same position, same authority. Amazing. What's that? That's the resurrection. That's the exaltation of Christ. That's what it purchased for us. Let's go to Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53, where we began talking about the sufferings of the Christ. Verse 7. We stopped at verse 6 before. Let's just read on verse 7. He was oppressed and was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb. So he opens not his mouth. His dumb meaning he didn't speak. When they were when they were pulling him before Pilate and before Herod and all that stuff, they would ask him a bunch of questions and he wouldn't say anything. This is what, he's, what it means is he was just mute like a lamb before his shearers. Verse 8, he was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken, and he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence. Neither was any deceit in his mouth, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed and he shall prolong his days and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He, God, shall see the travail of he of his, Jesus Christ's soul, and shall be satisfied. It pleased God to bruise him, not because God is a father who takes pleasure in his son's pain, but because God knew what was going to be produced by this event. He knew what was going to be produced, and that was the resurrection the winning back of all of mankind and the availability for people to know Christ and be saved from the palace of the strong man because the stronger one has come. Verse 11, he shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, God speaking, will I divide him a portion with the grave and he shall divide the what? Strong. With the strong. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? Because he has poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he made, he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. <laughs> wow. The spoil. The spoil of the strong man is the lives of people. But the stronger one came and showed him, I bind him, my authority's higher. <coughs> I'll take that spoil. And that was us. Let's go to Galatians chapter two. What's the response now? Galatians 2.20. How identified are we with Christ? For I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives me in the life which I now live in the flesh. I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Let's go to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6, verse 3 through 4 says, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized unto his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. This is your identity. You died with him. You were buried with him. You were raised with him, and Ephesians tells us, then you were exalted with him to sit at the right hand of the Father. When you sit at the right, you know, like the right hand of the Father, when you're sitting on somebody's right hand, you see how close you are to them? There's like proximity, there's intimacy, you're face to face, 
When you speak, you hear each other, there's fellowship. When you're sitting at somebody's right hand, that is the position that we have. That's the position that we pray from. That's the position that we walk from. That's the position that we live from. We're not trying to attain a position of victory. We operate already from that position <laughs> at the right hand of God. Romans 4, we'll close here. I lied. One more verse after this. <laughs> Romans 4. This is a section where it's talking about Abraham. And it goes through a story about how he obtained righteousness by faith in Christ. And not by the works of law, not by good behavior, not by, you know, not by gold stars. Um, that Abraham obtained righteousness by looking to the Messiah and knowing that someone would be there to be able to pay the price that he couldn't with his own life. All right. So Romans 4, 23 says, Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, meaning to Abraham. Verse 24, but it was written for us also, to whom it shall be imputed, righteousness, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus Christ our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. So the death part is to take and remove all of our bad <laughs> sins, transgressions, mental anguish, physical anguish, all that stuff takes a part. The death part removes all of our bad, but the resurrection part applies all of his good okay the death removes our bad the resurrection applies all his good you know because honestly it, functionally it wouldn't make sense for him to just remove the bad and just give you a clean slate you know why because you would screw it up <laughs> at some point you would screw it up and that is the history of all mankind forever <laughs> right all right. So he had to clean you, give you that clean slate. But what does the resurrection do? Seals you that way in his righteousness forever. Why? Because the righteousness is no longer attendant upon your work. It's attendant upon your faith in his work. Whew, my goodness, I'm getting goosebumps. <laughs> You've been given a great identity. An un unassailable identity in Jesus Christ. Far above all principality and power and God's intention. And according to the eternal purpose, his intention was that the heavenly powers would know the manifold wisdom of God through what? What he does in creating the church. Why? Because the church can spoil the strong man's house. When we preach the gospel, we spoil the strong man's house. We take people out of his domain where he had rest. He was the strong man and his goods were at peace, weren't they? Until a stronger one came. When we preach the gospel, when we give people eternal life through Jesus Christ, we are plundering the strong man's house. He's the God of this world. I'm not of this world. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through, okay? We are not of this world, but while we're here, we're like spiritual criminals, <laughs> just doing B and E's on the on the devil. All right, breaking and entering and taking all of his goods. What are his goods? The the health of people. We already saw that, right? That that that. What was his good in Luke eleven? It was the it was the person who had a dumb spirit. That was his treasure. Was stealing, killing, and destroying. But the stronger one came and took the treasure. That one's mine. Boom. Now, if this is proven, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. And they said, oh, man, he does it. And they, they, he does it in, in the name of the enemy. And God says, uh, 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 I did it for this very intention and purpose that the enemy would know the wisdom and power of God through who? My sons. <sighs> oh, my God. That is the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the exaltation to his right hand. What's the call to arms? Plunder his house. Amen. Right? Plunder his house. Preach the gospel. Get him saved. 
steal them from the strong man. Why? Because now, because of Christ, you're the strong man. <laughs> Hallelujah! Amen. I'm going to close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father God, I thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. I thank you for what you've done. Father, I don't even make requests right now. Just want to say thank you. Thank you. Thank you. In Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you.